amazing expert speakers here to get us in the mood and the frame of mind for the full conference on Globalization 4.0, uh, and this is the energy piece of it. So we're delighted to welcome Dr. Fatih Birol, who's the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency in Paris. Ian Kahn, who's the chief group, group Chief Executive at Centrica, the United Kingdom. Jean-Pascal Tricoir, who is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Schneider Electric in France. And Minister Chang Tianhua, the Minister of Energy from the People's Republic of China. So let's jump right in. Uh, Dr. Biro, 2018 was a big year. Um, and I've heard you call it the year of electrification. What do you mean by that, and where are we? No, we believe that electricity demand is growing very strongly, and maybe stronger than uh, many of us uh, believe. Just to put in a context, global energy demand in general grows very, very strongly, but electricity demand grows two times faster than the energy demand. So very strong growth of energy demand, mainly driven by the uh, increasing income levels around the world, and especially in the emerging markets. New uh, needs are coming. For example, if I ask, uh, make a, a survey among the colleagues here, what is the main driver of electricity consumption in the emerging countries? I don't know if anybody would guess before we make the uh, major report on air conditioners. Air conditioners are the number one drivers of the global electricity demand growth in India, uh, China, uh, uh, ASEAN countries, and these countries are the drivers of the global electricity consumption. So uh, therefore, uh, we have to be very clever what kind of uh, electricity sources, first of all, uh, we are going to choose in order to provide this electricity, number one. Number two, uh, it is very important to use that electricity efficiently so that we don't need to build unnecessary power plants than we uh, uh, normally use. For example, I mentioned air conditioners. Let's take India and Japan. In India, in order to provide the same comfort the, with the, uh, bring the temperature down, you have to, uh, you need three times more electricity than in Japan because of the low efficiency standards of the uh, boxes, air conditioners. It may seem a trivial thing, but it's a big thing. The air conditioners and how the refrigerators and the efficiency is critical. So the question is, we are going to see Electrification is a major driver. And uh, since we have the uh, Chinese minister uh, with us, uh, Minister, congratulations for your new and challenging uh, job, uh, by, by the way. Uh, we are seeing that uh, we will discuss, I'm sure, in a few minutes, uh, the, in the United States, oil and gas production is growing. Middle East, only the major oil and gas uh, center, Russia is like that. And the response from China in terms of energy in terms of the global energy picture is electricity. China is today number one in terms of electric cars, electric uh, uh, buses, and now making a major move, changing the heating system from a gas and coal-based system to electricity. So therefore, uh, I believe electricity is very important. Let me finish by saying, with the good news at least, uh, that uh, many of you uh, may know that the International Energy Agency since 20 years, we are looking at how many people have no access to electricity in the world. It's a major issue. Uh, you know as, as well, uh, uh, we discussed this issue several times. In, since the year 2000, it is coming down, it was two billion people. Now for the first time at the end of last year, number of people who have no access to electricity uh, went below one billion mark, benchmark, less than one, but still one billion people, right. two out of three people in Africa have no access to electricity. It's a shame. But it's a success. It came to uh, under one billion. And here, the price goes to uh, one country. Everybody made the effort, but one country especially, which is uh, India. Under Prime Minister Modi, they brought electricity to hundreds of millions of people. 
And as a result, the problem is now an electricity problem in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. To sum up, I believe electricity is definitely the future of the energy system for many years to come. Of course, we will need oil, gas, coal, uh, clean coal, uh, renewables, and others. But the world is going in the direction of electricity. Right. So to have this air conditioning load and to give access, it all comes back down to human, people, human beings and people. So Ian Kahn, consumers, how does this electrification change our relationship to consumers? How are you seeing that play out? Well, let me start firstly with <clears throat> some pretty big trends, which is as we're responding to climate change, we are driving decarbonization through policy. And this has resulted in the decentralization of the energy system. As Fatty said, there's more going on at the edge of the system rather than a big central supply and transmission arrangement. The second thing is because of that, customers have got more choice, they're becoming more powerful, and then digitization is accelerating the whole thing. What this is enabling, and Fatty's right, that as electricity dependency becomes higher, we have to find ways for <clears throat> customers to use energy and electricity more effectively and efficiently. And some of the, the technologies that are being used now are allowing, first of all, on-site generation at the point of use. They're allowing export of electricity back to the grid, so people actually can benefit from their excess generation. And there's the possibility of turning down demand. And so it's actually very exciting. And the key technologies that I think are enabling customers to be more powerful and will have a very big impact on the overall energy per unit GDP, because for years we've been focusing on lowering the carbon intensity of energy production. What we haven't been focusing on is lowering the amount of energy per unit GDP. And we should be very encouraged that since 1980 to about 2015, the energy intensity per unit GDP fell by two thirds. The technologies that are going to make a big difference, combined heat and power units, solar, heat pumps at the point of use, Batteries allowing for storage and then re-export of energy or optimization. The combination of batteries and demand response, which is allowing customers to effectively become virtual power plants where you switch on a battery or, and reduce demand at the same time. This means you need less central generation on the grid, electric vehicle integration, and then finally artificial intelligence, which is allowing predictive maintenance on the system. These are all the technologies we're going to need if we're going to be more effective and efficient in this electricity intensified world. Right, so I'd like to build on that decentralization theme and turn to Jean Pascal. So how has this decentralization changed industry's focus on technology? Are we looking at the right technologies? What do you see? Well, I believe that most of the technologies that allow or enable this decentralization and electrification are already existing. They are just not integrated. It's like every technology transition, they are not yet adopted completely or embraced completely by the users and the consumers. But it's going fast. So uh, let, me, let me build on what Fatih was saying about electrification. You spoke about HVAC. One of the fastest electric consumption today is the IT industry on everything going around electronics. Every time we use electronics, would it be from semiconductor manufacturing as well as networks, data center, data storage? That is fast growing. Today, 5% roughly of power consumption, soon to be 10%. And actually enabling the other face of it, which is a higher efficiency in everything we do. So um, to build on what Ian was saying, um, we absolutely see in our business a big move to the edge. So while the world of energy traditionally was very centralized, uh, the world of tomorrow will be a combination of centralized, where if you say, if you will, the cloud of energy is a grid, but more and more of the uh, capacity is going on the edge. And you see consumers taking over their energy equation and combining the edge together with the grid. So that's enabled, of course, by digitization. But if you look at the benefits of that, it's 
more efficiency, and there is still a vast potential behind efficiency. You still have 60% of energy consumption where there is no objective, no regulation, no objective to diminish the energy consumption. So there is still a big, the biggest, the fastest, the cheapest, uh, the most effective way of saving energy or producing green energy is to save energy. The second point is resilience. Uh, we've seen a world where there is more climate disorders. Uh, managing the va those variations of renewable energy is more complicated. Therefore, managing your energy system is becoming more, uh, uh, more complex. And going on the edge offers more resilience. It's like in social systems. If you centralize too much, it's more complicated to adjust what's happening. If you separate those systems, it's easier to manage. And what we see is people really managing more of it locally to share energy better, shave the peaks, which have been the traditional problems of electricity, and, and be more resilient in front of issues. Finally, also what we should recognize is going on the edge will be very job creative. It's creating many more jobs on the field close to the user to go on the edge and to deploy what we used to have before, which were centralized systems. And it puts people more in contact with your energy, what Ian was doing. And what we see is that every time we give access to a consumer to its energy bill, they immediately save on energy. So those things are combining together for a very different landscape of, of energy. Thank you. Minister Zhang. I would like to hear more about what China's energy policy is. You have the full spectrum of everything from very developed in many cities to developing. You have it all. So what is the, as you see in your new role as Minister of Energy, what is your energy policy looking forward? Ah, so yeah. First of all, thank you for giving me the floor. As you just said, people who has, have no electricity, actually, China, by the end of 2018, everybody has electricity in China, which is a huge in achievement. Secondly, I'd like to talk about our future change in China. In June 2014, President Xi proposed a new policy for energy revolution and one energy cooperation, namely consumption revolution, supply uh, revolution, technological revolution, and system revolution. And we will, want, we will in, reinforce, reinforce our energy international cooperation to ensure our energy security. So we have a new green and low carbon strategy for China by 2020 non-fossil energy and natural gas will account for 15 and 10 percent of overall primary energy, respectively. By 2013, these numbers will be 20 and 15 by 2030. And we would like to peak our CO2 emission as early as possible, and by and our CO2 emission per unit of GDP will be lowered by 60 to 65 percent compared to the level of 2005. So we estimate that China's clean energy industry will become main uh, energy sector in China by 2035. And also by 2050, this will be one of the most important energy uh, source in China. So China going forward in terms of consumption, so far we have uh, many achievements. For example, in 2018, non-fossil uh, energies and natural gas already accounted for 22%, which is a seven percentage increase by tw uh, compared to 2012. And coal consumption has been lowered to 59%, which is a nine percentage uh, decrease compared to 2012. Non-fossil uh, fossil energy in stock capacity accounted for 40%, and its production accounted for 30% in 2018. And 
per cap per unit GDP energy consumption has been decreased by 20 percent compared to 2012. The consumption has reached 307. Is the total proportion. Therefore, our energy policy has played an important role in the future transformation, I would say. Dr. Biro, you mentioned oil and gas. So let's turn a little bit to that sector and transportation. What do we need to do there? What do you see on the oil and gas front that we need to really accelerate or transition? So first of all, oil and gas, what happened last year uh, compared to previous uh, Davos. I think there are two major things happened. Number one, U.S. shale production. Now, that was uh, last year, these times, we came up with a, a estimate of the U.S. production growth, very bullish at the time, many colleagues said, about 1.5 million barrels per day. Big growth, we expected. And again, in the Davos meetings, many of the observers thought we were far too bullish. And I said, we don't know, we may revise them at the end of the year. We did revise them, but we revised them upwards. 2.1 million barrels of growth coming from US shale. Huge growth. They added uh, in uh, one year, uh, one uh, Mexico, just the growth. And uh, if anybody thinks we have seen the impact of shale revolution fully, he or she is making a mistake, but a big mistake. It is yet to come to see the impact of the shale revolution, oil and gas uh, in the United States. Far-reaching implications, energy, economy, and beyond. This is number one. Number two, on the natural gas front biggest development. It is China. Uh, it is China impact on gas is amazing. The picture what we have seen the oil markets, China effect 10 years ago, we are seeing on the natural gas markets now under the President Xi's motto of making the skies of China blue again. China pushed the uh, natural gas consumption very strongly and as we speak now, China took over uh, uh, Japan as the largest natural gas importer of the world. The big double-digit growth. So on the production of uh, oil in the United States and on the consumption of uh, gas in China, of course, U.S. gas production increased uh, very strongly as well. And now, how do we use them in a more sustainable way? So I see that many companies are giving strong signals to use the uh, produce the oil and gas in a sustainable way, ranging from looking at the uh, applications like hydrogen, carbon capture and utilization, or they are looking how to reduce the methane emissions uh, in their uh, production practices, which is very good. Uh, but uh, it is uh, very important to uh, note that we will be with oil and gas many years to come, whatever the scenario we look at it. The most important thing is how to uh, use it in a sustainable way. I have to talk about oil and gas, and one final remark on Middle East, so that it's not misunderstood, as I have the, uh, here we, have, we enjoy the, uh, the presence of OPEC Secretary General, my friend Mohammed uh, Barkindo uh, with us uh, here today. Even though U.S. is now a very important oil producer, Middle East will remain the largest exporter of oil many years to come because U.S. produce a lot of oil, but most of them they use at home for domestic purposes. So Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia, will remain the largest exporter of oil for many years uh, to come. But for this year, 2019, Let's pay a special attention to U.S. shale once again, because some of the observers last year, I think, made uh, wrong assumptions, underestimated the U.S. shale growth. Yes. 
So Ian, Con, you have, you have worked at BP for a long time, so you know this sector very well. Let's turn a little bit to, as, as Fatih was talking about, the acceleration of technology. And what is, how do, we, how do we not have to reinvent the wheel? Give us some use cases. You, you have a lot of interesting things you're working on. How do, how do we see this really manifesting <clears throat> in reality? So Catherine, just to comment, to build on Fatih's points, because <clears throat> both you and Fatih mentioned using oil and natural gas more effectively. And, and just, I, I spent 30 years nearly in producing and also in the consumer end of the oil and gas business. I think there's a real obvious pathway for transport, which started some time ago, which is the increasing efficiency of the internal combustion engine, then very significant penetration of hybridization, so the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which have got the range and the interoperability, and then finally the penetration of pure electric vehicles. And what we're now seeing in Centrica is customers, whether they are business customers or consumers, wanting propositions that integrate electric vehicles into their mm -hmm. lives or their business. The problem, though, is we've got to be We've got to recognize two things. We need to decarbonize the grid in parallel with the increased uh, use. And also, there are some practical issues around electric vehicle charging, for example, in multi-residential buildings or in the center of cities. And nevertheless, this is happening. And on natural gas, the biggest challenge, as Fatih and I often talk about, is the decarbonization of heat. And that is a really big issue. And we have to start with the efficiency side of it first, and then we need to progressively look at, at heat pump penetration and other ways of taking people progressively off the natural gas grid. But this is going to take a very long time. And in, in the initial period, it, we are actually going to be more dependent on natural gas, as the minister has just described. Now, on your, your, you asked use cases. Um, and let me try and tie it also to digitization, which is accelerating things. There are, I, I described some technologies that are being deployed at the edge of the system, but some of the digitization technologies that are really helping optimize the system, firstly, digital control systems. From the simple in the home, we've got 1.3 million customers who control their heating in their home from their smartphone. So what? Well, the so what is that a recent survey we did over 55% of them are saving 12% on their natural gas bill just by being more precise, more in control. Integrated solutions platforms for business customers that allow the business to optimize the whole energy system that they've got, from production to storage to, to consumption to demand response, that's becoming a real business for the business customer. And then one of the most exciting ones is optimized dispatch using digital systems. We've got 11 gigawatts under management across Europe that sits in customers' yards or on the roof of their factories, all, all low carbon technology. And we are dispatching that against micro management of, or monitoring of the weather systems to optimize dispatch of, of renewables. Those are some of the biggest applications. There are productivity applications for insight into energy use and productivity of all sorts of equipment. And then finally, the last one I'll mention is blockchain. We're currently working on a 20 million euro project in the UK to put peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy in an automated way into the edge of the grid so that consumers and businesses can that, Homes can sell to each other while we're all at work and the money can transfer into people's bank accounts and your home is just able to optimize your energy. These are all ways in which digitization is accelerating the system. And you asked me, the last thing, I'm sorry, just on learning, I mean, just one plug for the World Economic Forum system initiative on the future of energy that Fatih and I co-chair, we're trying to join the dots so that one country, as it learns about a policy intervention, can share it with others so that we can benefit and we don't keep reinventing the wheel. And as particular ways of solving problems are found, we can translate them into other geographies. An example in Colombia with a grid edge 
um, experiment that the minister drove, and we've been able to propagate that into Argentina and Brazil, for example. Yeah, and I'd love to get back to governance in just a second. But I, I want to um, ask Jean Pascal something, because we've been talking a lot about technology, about resources, and yet we're seeing before our eyes uh, climate change manifesting in increased storms, in wildfires that we've had in the US. What are you seeing on technology from a resilience, really from adaptation, but from resilience standpoint from where you are? Well, uh, all the climatic disorders which we are facing today are putting a lot of pressure on the energy system. So what we've seen, on, we were speaking about that before, uh, more and more customers have equipped themselves with an edge system, a microgrid, which is combining renewable storage and being linked to the grid uh, so that they can better, better manage this equation of resilience. On doing that, they are also managing the equation of efficiency on cost, because in many cases it brings uh, it brings the cost down. So it started by the most critical application, typically the military, uh, where you install a military base, and you've got on 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 some of them we are uh, facing power breakdowns, and they uh, we help them to build quite big insulation, uh, fit 15,000 people on the edge uh, with microgrids. Then it went into other mission critical application, hospital. This is a place where you don't want the power breakdown to happen when you are in the surgery room. So more microgrids coming on, on board. And now it's spreading to neighborhoods, uh, technology parks, uh, so that people are becoming more resilient. I'd like to add on on what, uh, on, on switching a little bit gear, but Ian was speaking about the consumer yeah. with digitization. Yeah. I think the, the, the potential of digitization is even far beyond efficiency. So we work in majority in the commercial and industrial uh, part of the equation. Of course, an OPEX on energy efficiency, what we see today across thousands of applications, is 25% of energy efficiency. But think about it. When you build such a site, your biggest, large part of the investment is a capex. By working fully on digitization of this, this is more 30 to 40% that you can gain. And, and we've worked particularly as we speak about oil and gas. Oil and gas industry has been looking really to more efficiency, especially during the year of crisis. And you have a large part of your efficiency which is happening during the construction phase, during that phase from the CAPEX to the OPEX, where there was one digital uh, model here, mm -hmm. and another digital for operation. And our obsession in the past 10 years has been to integrate all of that digital cycle with a software suite that follows you from the construction to uh, the operation. And they are the gains of efficiency from the construction where we avoid many people bickering on the, on the work side because the plans were not precise into the world of operation has been uh, a massive. So we started by operations, OPEX, but be prepared for a world where uh, the next steps of efficiency will be in the world of CAPEX on the transition from CAPEX to uh, operations. And we have the same thing with utilities, same thing with buildings. So the world of digital is integrating all over the life cycle of, uh, of, of the installations. Yeah. That's great. So, Minister Zhang, how is China looking at this? You and you have a history with oil and gas. Zhang, well, um, how is China integrating technologies as you move forward with your policy on decarbonization and access? Well, in fact, China is one of the largest consumption country of energy. So we have to focus on our own energy development. From per the perspective of oil, we have to keep the production over uh, 200 million tons. But in terms of uh, natural gas, we see that last year we have seen over 7% uh, of the mix. However, we know that northern China is not transforming into a clean energy use. We hope to increase the proportion of uh, natural gas, increasing to uh, 280 million tons, representing uh, over 200 million tons of increase compared with 2014. In terms of consumption and supply, we have seen that uh, we are uh, focusing on clean energy in terms of wind, hydrogen, 
uh, hydropower as well as wind power and uh, photovoltaic powers. We see that our wind power have reached about 350 million kilowatts and the uh, solar power has reached 170 million uh, kilowatts. In terms of nuclear power, we are seeing a, a provision of um, one, 58 million kilowatts. So we see that the uh, utilization efficiency for clean energy has increased. We have seen that underutilization has lowered by 3% in terms of solar power and 5% in terms of wind power, where we'll also see uh, great efforts have been put into the digitalization of our energy supply system in order to lower energy consumption. In terms, we are utilizing AI, big data, and their relevant applications in energy sector. Through our efforts, we hope to maximize um, our solutions in energy. Going to uh, turn to the audience momentarily for any interventions or questions from the audience. But first, I wanted to touch base with you one more time, Dr. Birol, to address this. Yes, yes. And uh, also any yeah. governance issues that may need to change as you think about moving forward. So I want to react to two things here of my colleagues. The first, uh, uh, Minister uh, uh, mentioned the China and the renewable numbers. So put the things in a context. Uh, China is today number one in terms of wind energy in the world, number one in solar, number one in hydropower, and if the US policies do not change, number one in nuclear power in a few years of time. So doing a lot of uh, job, uh, China, plus they have improved, for example, the coal efficiency coal-fired power plants. China gets a lot of uh, electricity from coal today. If the Chinese coal power plant didn't increase the efficiency, today we would add one more gigaton, huge uh, to the uh, global emission. So uh, good work for China, but more to done, more to do, I should say, uh, especially in terms of reducing the emissions and maybe as important as that local pollution in the cities. It's a very important job. Second point, and the oil and electric cars, a few of my colleagues mentioned. Now, one good news, one not uh, perhaps so good news for the colleagues who are uh, big subscribers of the electric cars. Good news is that we are now almost reaching five million electric cars across the world. Five million, and half of them are China. China, I forgot, number one in electric cars, electric buses as well, but five million electric cars. Many of us hail this a big improvement, big achievement. Yes, it is big. What does it mean for the oil demand? I tell you, just to put in a context, five million electric cars. This year, we expect global oil demand will increase about 1.3 million barrels per day. 1.3. Some people say 1.2, some people 1.3 million barrels per day. And the effect of five million electric cars out of 1.3 million uh, barrels per day is 50,000 barrels per day. 50,000 versus 1.3 million. So just to see that uh, we should put the things in a context, uh, uh, first of all, 5 million is nothing because we have 1 billion internal combustion engine cars, number one. Number two, cars are not the driver <coughs> of oil demand growth, full stop. Drivers are trucks, petrochemical industry, uh, the planes. Asia is just starting to fly. Asia is just starting to fly. So these are the drivers. Just focus on the electric cars. Big electric car sales and saying this is the end of the oil is definitely misleading. We like it or not. We, some of us like it, some of us dislike it. This is, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the other thing. Second, where does the uh, electricity come from to say that the electric cars is a solution to our uh, 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 climate change problem. It is not. Today we have 5 million electric cars. Even if there were 300 million with the current power generation system in the world, the impact on the CO2 emissions is less than 1%. Nothing. So 
the issue is not only the electrify the cars, but if you want to have a solution for the uh, power uh, sector, if you can find a solution power sector, decarbonize it, CO2 emissions will not be going down. It may be helpful for the local pollution, but for the global emissions, it is not. So just to put the things in the context, electric cars are today, when we look at the numbers, not the end of the uh, oil era, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I wanted to say uh, that it is very important to acknowledge what China is uh, doing in terms of renewable energy, but also to say, Mr. Minister, we have high expectations from you as the world to reduce the emissions uh, uh, more and uh, bring more prosperity to your citizens mm -hmm. and to the rest of the world, uh, Mr. Minister. Great. I would be glad to take questions from the audience, and please wait for a microphone to come. There's one here. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Hill. I'm from Liquid Telecom, which is a pan-African digital infrastructure company. And among other things, we're building out a data center network across Africa. So we're talking about critical loads in countries that have fairly unstable grids. Um, and I was wondering if uh, the panel could speak about how utilities are coping with the transitions you've outlined as we move from centralization to the edge. Um, most African utilities are not profitable, but that is not an African challenge with PG&E just filing for bankruptcy and a number of other um, developed economies that have struggling utilities. And how will these firms survive and what will differentiate? Great. Ian, I'm looking at you. Well, I don't know why you're looking at me because <laughs> Centric is not really a utility, although we're labelled <laughs> we're labelled as one. But the, in the sense that we don't run big central generation and big transmission networks. But to answer the question, I mean, first of all, the micro solution. If you've got uh, data centres that you're trying to build on the edge of the grid, or the the grid's not very reliable, clearly that some of the distributed technologies that we've been talking about, John Pascal and I. Combined heat and power units, if there's some form of natural gas, or solar and batteries, this is coming to the point where uh, you will be able to put backup generation, or it could even be based on diesel initially, so that you have the reliability. On the bigger question, I think the the what the world of things called utilities is very much in transition. This idea of a central production and transmission system where the customer just takes whatever comes to the wall is gone. It is dramatically changing and all of the things we've been talking about is putting pressure on the central generation system. This, I'm talking mainly in the Western world, clearly in growing economies, there is still a need for more baseload power. But what we're now seeing in Europe and the US actually are people having to make political interventions simply to support the amount of baseload power that exists to keep the light on because it's becoming underutilized and unstable. And I believe we're, I, can, I can understand point B a little bit better than I can how we're going to get there. At some point, we're going to reach a place where the transmission system will be partly an insurance policy. And what we haven't figured out is who's going to pay for it. There will be central generation, and it will need to be highly utilized to be effective. Distributed systems will need to connect into the transmission system and export and import from it. And part of the remuneration of the grid will become a sort of membership slash insurance policy. I can't see any other destination. I, most countries are having trouble getting there because you've seen it in the United States with solar where you know who actually pays if local generators don't actually pay when they take transmission off the grid, who's going to end up paying? We'll solve all these problems, but uh, they're coming to a cinema near us. Catherine, may, may I uh, keep going on that subject? I, I think that decentralization of energy is a great chance for many emerging countries. For what we see, we are equipping more and more places in the world that were really difficult to equip before because you can deploy a local grid. So speak about the island countries. There are plenty in Southeast Asia, uh, remote places in Africa. I think here it's not only a technological problem, it's a societal problem. Well, if you want it to be effective, you need to manufacture locally. And uh, this is what we do. 
and you need to train a lot of people, which is great, because when those people, when people are trained, then they can take care of the community and bring more services around energy. But the worst is to come with something which has been manufactured from remote and land it on the ground, and there is nobody to take care, because guess what, after two months or three months, it doesn't work anymore. But what we see is that really there is an empowerment of, uh, of people around energy. Now, on the role of utilities in the world that's becoming more electrical, utilities have a major role. They are the conductors. They are in the middle. They can be insurers, uh, they can be providers, but at the end of the day, they have a major role. But it's a major reinvention for many of them, major reinvention. We are working with them on the technology. Well, digital is a big thing. I mean, uh, it used to be a more simple world where uh, generation was fixed, consumption was quite fixed, uh, it was easy to administrate. Now, everybody has gotten out of work. I mean, you've got uh, renewable things which are going up, down, consumption which are modula modulated up and down. So the big thing that utilities are doing is getting digital, uh, managing the central and the edge, um, we see many of them inventing a new model, which is really impressive. So, uh, like in every transition, there are risks, but there are also opportunities, and some are exiting as true winners of this transition. Terrific. We have another question or intervention. Uh, good morning, everybody. Johnny Mas from Repsol. Uh, Mr. Virol, you said that the electricity is growing, and that's okay, is right? Uh, fortunately, I mean, uh, a part of this electricity is produced uh, using renewable energy, but unfortunately, I mean, uh, en renewable energy is intermittent. Uh, this kind of energy needs today a backup. And bad news is that the coal uh, power is still a large part of the electricity production in the world. I mean, do you think that, for instance, promoting electric vehicles in countries like Germany, Poland, and some others were. We are burning coal to feed electric cars, increasing the, the CO2 footprint in the world is a rational policy. And do you think that shifting from coal to gas in this scenario, on top, of course, of promoting energy efficiency and, uh, and promoting, of course, renewable generation could be one of the most efficient ways to reduce the CO2 footprint in the world in, in a cheap way? Thank you. So, uh, I mean, CEO of Repso asked many questions in uh, one minute. So <laughs> if I can go uh, very three blocks, maybe renewables. So, first of all, good news. Uh, last year, uh, renewables uh, uh, grew very, very strongly. Captain. So, uh, the boat, uh, wind, and solar, 100 uh, gigawatts uh, solar, 50 gigawatt new wind came in the picture. Again, uh, China, United States, India were uh, main drivers as as well as EU. But if I can put in a context, global electricity demand grows about 2% roughly in, in a year in, in the world. This 150 gigawatts of uh, renewables, the electricity coming from there is equal to 1% growth. Other 1% is coming mainly from uh, uh, coal and uh, natural gas. So therefore, just to expect that the, with the, this pace of renewables, we will see a decarbonization of our energy system is extremely optimistic. Because at the same time, electricity is only a part of our total energy system. And in terms of CO2 emissions, it is less than 40%. Uh, there is a more than 60% coming from other things. This is number one. Number two, electric cars. Now, I completely agree. I give you one without giving a country name. In a country where you have about, uh, let's say, about 40%, uh, uh, 50% of coal in electricity generation, if you have to choose one 1990 model diesel car versus 2019 electric car, I think it is better to buy the 1990 diesel car if your bulk of your electricity comes from coal, full stop. The new thing doesn't mean it is better mm -hmm. if you do not decarbonize your electricity system. If you want to decarbonize your transportation, you not only look at the cars, but you look at your, where the power uh, comes from. This is number two. Number three, what are we going to do with coal? Are we, today, a big chunk of the coal comes in, in China, uh, India, Indonesia. So these people provide electricity to their citizens, which are low and mid-income levels. We cannot say 
We decided in Davos, please shut down the coal plants. It is impossible. In United States, in Europe, coal plants are, on average, 42 years old. They are coming to the retirement age, as many of us are here, so 42 years old. Mm -hmm. But in Asia, coal plants are, on average, 11 years old. They have to pay back to the investment. How can we dare to ask them, please do so? This, uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. So what can we do? Two things. One, try to equip those uh, coal plants uh, with the carbon capture. This is number one. Number two, find incentives to compensate their losses if we want to ask for early retirement. Otherwise, we can decide whatever we want in Davos, Paris, Brussels, whatever we want, but they will not do it because they provide electricity to poor people and their money is not returned back to the utilities. Who would, would Ian do it? Would, uh, uh, would Jean Pascal would do it? Nobody would do it after they make the investment before it is paid back. Who would do that? Why do, why, if we don't do it, why don't we ask China, India, Indonesia, and the others to do it? So we should have double standards. And in, in my view, Captain, if you ask me, what is the main problem of the climate change today? There are many of them, but I would put the young, inefficient coal power plants fleet of 2,000 gigawatts in Asia with all these uh, uh, conditions attached. May I just ask, add one little comment to that? In the, UK, in the UK, and I realize this is not the countries you've talked about, a high carbon price, the combination of the European trading system and a carbon tax or floor, has resulted in the early retirement of all the coal plants. Now, who pays is the key question, and the only way it's working in the UK is, unfortunately, for everyone who's using electricity to pay. And that way, through carbon pricing, we are accelerating the early retirement of plant. They're not as young as those in, in Asia, but it's going to be crucial we find a way to retire coal as fast as we can. I would be, uh, personally, less, less affirmative on the future of energy, because what strikes me is that those kind of discussion is the one that we had about the internet on the world of telecommunication in, uh, in the 90s. With the same kind of saying, well, the world of before, we cannot decommission, we cannot... But we're always surprised by the adoption of technology. And, of course, there are economics behind some power plants and things. But in some cities, uh, emissions, particles, has become the first political debate. Uh, then there is a new generation uh, coming up, youngsters, and they don't have the same patience with the lack of reaction to the environment. I think there is urgency respect to the climate uh, question, right? We are more on a trajectory of 3.5 to 1.5, and we pay for the disasters uh, linked to that. So I'm not sure it's just economic. Uh, it's, uh, it's about reality of life of people in their environment, and we are always surprised by the speed of technology adoption. So digitization, electrification. And, and the thing is that it's a parallel uh, avenue. Uh, of course, electricity doesn't bring any plus if we don't decarbonize electricity. So the question is, how do we accelerate this uh, in the future? So I would stay very uh, open and alert on, uh, on the evolution because, well, people, uh, youngsters, uh, the new generation will push us which is probably great because this is how technology evolves. That's true. Speaking of youngsters, my children say, no, I have eyes on the back of my head. I think there's someone behind me that has a question. There's someone who, you have the microphone? Oh, good. Yeah, good morning. I'm Dr. Ram Kumar from Indian Oil Corporation. And uh, uh, my question is uh, partly answered by Mr. Fete. My question is actually on decarbonization of the whole economy, and especially for countries like uh, India and uh, um, China. We just can't banish uh, the coal. We can ill afford uh, banishing the coal because coal is still the richest energy source and the cheapest energy source. So my question is that World Economic Forum or any other global forum, there should be a need for greater collaboration of exchanging carbon capture and utilization technologies. I think there are a handful of commercially established carbon capture and utilization technologies, and there should be a greater cooperation to these Asian countries, where, where the established technologies need to be shared 
so that on a global platform, the decarbonization will get, gain traction. So any comment? Is there any global framework that is, uh, that is in place, are going to be in place to share these kind of technologies? I would like to seek the views of the panel. And I would like to turn to uh, Minister Chong too to talk about what chi how China sees this a similar situation. Uh. Indeed, uh, yeah, and, and our friend from India has proposed a great question. Indeed, uh, in the case of China and India, under our current uh, context and circumstances, it's unrealistic unrealistic to eliminate all forms of coal and heat-powered electricity. But we can make efforts. For example, in 2008, by 2018, our coal-powered electricity has accounted for less than 60% of our overall mix. We have closed many uh, low-efficient uh, power plants, coal power plants, equivalent of 800 million tons of production and equivalent of over 100 million kilowatts of production. I would also like to respond to the development of distributed uh, electricity or energy, especially for developing countries. Distributed uh, deployment is very important. However, in order to resolve the security and safety issue of our grid, and how do we optimize and rationalize wind power, for example, would be very important. We are also developing construction of, um, for example, the windmill, uh, as well as more flexible coal-powered electricities, so as to complement different types of energy. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is just step back for a second, and I'll give a few reflections and then pose one final question. And I'm sorry we weren't able to address everybody's interventions and questions. You can certainly pose them afterwards. And I'm afraid I neglected to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Catherine Hamilton. Um, I, among other things, am co-chair of the Advanced Energy Technology pa Council, which is a new council under the Future of Energy stewardship. Um, and we have discovered and thought that as much advanced energy technology as we have, it is here and it's ready. We need to accelerate it. And that's something everyone here has talked about is that we have solutions. We need to accelerate them. And digitization will help us accelerate them. Countries like China can help lead the way with their public policies to accelerate at the same time that the youth of the world are stepping up and saying, we need to do this faster and we need to do it in our terms without forgetting that we need all of the resources available that we have already invested in. So that's sort of where we are in a very interesting geopolitical landscape right now. As we go forward through this annual meeting, and then, you know, this annual meeting is a moment in time. We then have to take what we learn and the connections that we make and the collaborations that we form here and go and act and have impact going forward for years to come. So I would ask each of the speakers here for a final thought on how do we accelerate or what should we be thinking about moving forward so we can really have an impact and make a difference? Minister Zhang, you start and we'll end up with you. The future of China, indeed, will lie in resolving uh, issues and uh, supply energy in a low carbon and green way. Of course, we have to leverage the resources that Mother Nature grants us. These uh, sustainable energy, for example, uh, thermal, uh, wind power, photovoltaic powers, all these will contribute to the lower production of um, carbon dioxide as well as carbons. So I think that's almost in, most important. So when, when I look at the future, I think the two biggest problems we have is probably climate change, with already visible uh, collaterals, and alleviating poverty and reducing inequality. And uh, the first inequality is access to energy. I mean, people who have access to energy have access to modernization. The other ones don't. So energy is at the crossroad of the two uh, on in contradictory terms. But I think our generation has a fantastic responsibility and opportunity because 
in the past, there was only one way uh, somewhere to consider energy, and we are at crossroads at the moment. And I would incite all of us not to look at what we have to build from the past point of view, but more directed to the future and consider all the implications. But we are trying with energy to address probably the two biggest challenges of our generation. Absolutely, yeah. I, my view is that, as Fatty and others uh, have illustrated, we are not on the path that we need to be on. And the problem is many of the reasons why we're not on that path are fundamental, um, as Fatty talked about. Um, oil demand is going to go up, etc. And electric vehicles are not going to answer the problem. The whole of transport is only 30% of greenhouse gases. So my belief is boldness and understanding are the two ingredients missing in central government. And our mission uh, in the effort that we're all involved in here is to try and help governments understand that we're not on the right path and we're going to have to intervene in a more bold way. And then, the, so that's boldness and understanding with governments. And then the second part is the unleashing of the discretionary innovation in society around new energy technologies and demand. Between these two things, we will solve this, but we are not there at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I would say the following, very simple. Uh, we discuss, uh, you also a little lot of uh, discussion, uh, Katrin, since some time, how important the climate change challenge in front of us uh, is. It's completely true, but the more we discuss, the more the, uh, the emissions increase at the same time. So it's the, the 2017, and we just uh, announced 2018 emissions increased. So, and we all know that energy is the main responsible sector here. So, in my view, what we need is the following, two things. One, we have to understand the order of magnitude of the challenge. This is uh, number one. Not only the new infrastructure, how it will be, but also the existing lock-in infrastructure is there that will be with us 30, 40 years, how we can intervene in the existing infrastructure, such as the coal plants, CCUS. I see it is a very important part of the equation. So this is the understanding, the order of magnitude of the challenge is number one. Number two, maybe more importantly, now today everybody has his or her own solution. Some say it's renewables, the other one renewables, the other one CCVS, the other one nuclear power. This is completely absurd when you look at the order of magnitude of the challenge. I don't like nuclear. Okay, then nuclear is out. Nuclear people say, I don't like uh, solar because it's uh, intermittent. It's also out. So at the end of the day, we have nothing left. So when we look at the, uh, the problem, if we are serious, we need all technologies, all technologies which can help to reduce the emissions even one gram. So we don't have the luxury to exclude any of the technologies. Uh, our aim should be not to boost our ego, but to reduce the emissions. And if we are serious about it, we need all the technologies. Thank you. So, thank you, Fatih Birol, Ian Khan, Jean-Pascal Tricoir, and Minister Jean. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody here. Now go for, forth boldly to the rest of the annual meeting. Thank you.